it's time for the SLMA Radio Show with your host today, me, Susan Finch. So glad you're here. Hi, everyone, and welcome to SLMA Radio. And today, I'm your host, Susan Finch. We have back with us, we've had her before, is Linda Zimmer. Linda Zimmer is a certified privacy manager and she's been certified by the International Association of Privacy Professionals. This is a really big deal. It's the largest international association. She's also the president of Marcom Interactive, and they specialize in digital marketing. These two intersect quite seriously. And so I wanted to have Linda on as part of a three-part series to talk about security and data and such issues. So Linda, welcome. Thank you. I'm delighted to be with you. Thanks for the invitation to join you. Well, once you told me about your new certification, I thought, oh, this is such a hot topic for everybody. And there's so many myths that we need to, you know, I'm not going to pull out the old myth buster thing because <laughs> we're a little, you know, this is more serious than that. We need to help dispel some of what you might, you know, folks think that they're quite comfortable with or they might be a little overly paranoid about. So we're going to tackle three of the most common myths and the biggest myths that seem to plague so many posts and plague us with misinformation. Yeah, yeah, there are a lot of myths around there. And, um, you know, probably the biggest one is that it's all about technology, um, you know, and that we've got to be just absolutely paranoid and pour a ton of resources into our IT security. Um, and the mat- fact of the matter is, data breaches, which have been in the news a little bit lately, uh, come from a lot of different areas within the business. And uh, you know, I'm a marketer, I'm a digital marketer, but I just really saw this trend where uh, information privacy concerns by customers was, uh, you know, driving a lot of really interesting conversations in side the organization um, because it's a brand issue it's a reputation issue besides a big financial business issue because these breaches are very expensive and you know they come from lots of different areas in the business and so we do need to kind of think about these issues and kind of dispel some of the complacency um, around it with our business processes Well, you know, for those of you that aren't familiar with Linda, she has a a moniker also a Z-Net lady. And you have been championing, championing, always an awkward word, um, privacy, security for years. And anybody that's followed her posts, subscribes to her blogs, you will see that this is a common thread in what she talks about. And I think this is what is, you know, your passion for this drove you to seek that certification before we dive into the myths, can you give us a little bit of background about that certification that you really worked hard to get? Yeah, um, actually there are, I, I'm, I'm heading towards a couple of other certifications too because what the um, uh, privacy, the International Association of Privacy Professionals does is make several certi- certifications available. And I would really encourage everybody who's the least bit interested in a career move not just a transition, but actually um, embellishing your own career is to look into this. So the certification that I first chose is called the CIPM, which is the Certified Information Privacy Manager. And what that one focuses in on is, first of all, you've got to have a foundation in data security concepts. So that's the first thing you study. And then after that, where you really focus is on how do we operationalize security and privacy within our organizations. So that certification helps you know how to implement those kinds of frameworks and processes with across the organization. So it's not really focused on marketing, it's really focused on how does the organization create a culture of security and privacy in everything that they do so that they can avoid compliance problems, big financial hit, huge hit to your reputation. I mean, I, you know, I have to admit, I don't use a credit card at, at Target anymore. I don't use my debit card anymore. I actually write an old-fashioned check because um, this hit me in the gut. It's like, wow, I 
my card was compromised. I had to do a couple of things to make sure that uh, you know I was safe and sound. So it is a big hit to my decision to shop and how I shop. So those are big things that hit your customers, whether you're a consumer-facing customer or a business-facing customer. Well, and this, you brought up a good point, though. You said it isn't just a marketing thing. This all has to play together, though. If marketing and sales don't also have at least a degree of this knowledge, it's difficult to incorporate into your best practices for training, for sales procedures, for web design. It all matters, and it all plays together. And I don't think people realize that. They all think, oh, no, that's IT. IT is dealing with that. I don't deal with that. And they separate it out way too much. So then there's this blissful ignorance at the marketing and sales end. Mm -hmm. And they don't realize their responsibility. Exactly. And, you know, what's really interesting about this particular certification is it gives you this bird's eye view of the organization and how all of those things fit together. So, for example, in marketing, um, you know, the salespeople probably are using Salesforce or some kind of customer management software, and so they feel very siloed. This is the information that they own. But the fact of the matter is, one of my clients also uses Salesforce to um, transact and record financial transactions. So which means that credit card information, transaction information, other information resides within Salesforce and so is therefore available. So here you now have marketing and finance uh, overlapping within the same database and so some of the questions you have to raise is okay, we've got physical controls like permission setting, um, but then we also, you know, need just some basic uh, cultural, company cultural ideas about what's confidential, and the reason is some of the bis biggest links come through the sales organization. Why? Because they have access to one of, probably one of the most important ass assets a business has, and that's their customer database, their customer information. So it isn't siloed to IT, it flows through the entire organization. So you think about, uh, you know, in terms of this uh, certification back to that, is this gives you this bird's eye view that, hey, everything in the organization is connected and we've got to really be smart about where our data sits, where it's stored, and what is happening to it when it's on the move. I agree. So let's move in then to that first myth. And myth one is hacking is the number one way data is breached. And well, if you follow the news, you would indeed think that hackers are the number one way that company information, customer information is compromised. And the fact of the matter is it's employees and that 40% of all data breaches come from employee mistakes, um, stolen laptops, um, just being negligent in terms of leaving your set, your uh, computer signed on, um, flash drives, external storage, etc. So it actually is not the hackers. Only 20 to 25 percent of breaches come from the things that we hear about in the news, like Target, et cetera. One example is, uh, a very recent one, is Morgan Stanley, which is a wealth manager, uh, recently had thousands of customer records, well-to-do, wealthy individuals, um, posted on a website that was advertising this data for sale. So, yeah, so for, you know, X number of dollars per record, um, nefarious individuals, shall we say, could purchase this information, um, and this was very personal information and very personally identifiable information. That was a breach uh, by an employee. Now, how that happened is still in discussion, but it seems apparent that he did indeed download a customer database to his machine. Um, now, whether someone hacked into his machine and uploaded it or whether he did is still in question, 
but that's a prime example of an employee taking a hugely important business asset and placing it out on the web and selling it um, to individuals who probably don't have kind uses for it. Well, the other half of that, though, is those that are desperate for good leads but don't want to spend the money through the proper channels or spend the time or the marketing dollars take the shortcut and go look for this data thinking they're only getting certain pieces of information yet all of it might come in whatever it is they're buying if they're buying it from you know a not not a very reputable source you might say <laughs> yeah you know another prime example of that is um, a marketer who uh, had obviously access to customer information and had a friend in another company who was a direct marketer and she decided to do an, a, this friend a favor and copy the database so that the direct marketer could use that customer data and so that was a nice little thing. <laughs> However, what happened was that other party commingled that with lists that were purchased and then that information got stolen. So, so this was an indirect breach. Um, you know, a marketer did a favor for a friend in another marketing company and decided it would be a smart idea to share that information. Well, um, clearly you don't know what these other companies, what kind of security measures these other companies have in place. And did your customers give you permission to share that information? Right. You know, and so, yeah, this is where the security, the actual physical security that we take kind of intersects with employee training. I've had, um, and I have, you know, kind of a, I'll not mention names, <laughs> kind of story. You know, here's a story that's totally innocent, but it led to something bad. A company that has medical records and manages them for their patients, working with a marketing online marketing company, the person who you know is doing the online wants to do an email, and the patients have all said, "Go ahead and send me emails. That's fine." But the person at the office exported the patient list without cleaning out sensitive information columns, trying to hurry, trying to help, trying to provide the information, not knowing what was needed, not knowing databases well enough. All they knew how to do is click export. Mm -hmm. So they did. They passed it on. The marketing company then got all the data, didn't take the time to really clean it out either, uploaded it to something like MailChimp, Constant Contact. Mm -hmm. Suddenly that list is in that system. Yep. That system gets hacked. There it is. It exactly. is out there. And totally, again, innocent, thinking that they all have permissions, but a few missed steps or a little bit of laziness or you know those types of precautions can lead to disaster very quickly. Yeah, and you know the fact that you bring up medical records is really interesting because that, believe it or not, is the number one things that hackers are after right now are medical records for medical identity theft. And you think, oh yeah, it's just you know I just don't want people knowing what I'm going to the doctor for or what disease I'm managing. But the fact of the matter is, even more than credit card records, medical records are what hackers are after because it's a boon to be able to use medical insurance, medical identity for reimbursements, um, and, you know, basically take your medical history and, and then be duping uh, the payment sources to get to get payment um, based on you know your medical history so uh, you know the fact that we look at medical records and of course we know all about HIPAA which are the which are the regulations surrounding medical records but the fact of the matter is not everyone that handles medical records is a HIPAA um, regulated entity so uh, you know we have to kind of look at this and say, okay, even though we're not technically under the compliance of HIPAA, we still need to be training employees about HIPAA compliance because we are dealing with personal medical records. Well, in these small offices too, these small medical offices that contract with independent people like myself, 
they need to be aware that you know the people they contract with need to follow those guidelines as well because it all will point back to the origination of the data which would be the doctor's office right <clears throat> you know and another just kind of really scary example for those of us that are independent contractors or freelancers or consultants is um, we can be held liable for who we hire to handle data. Um, one recent example is the Federal Trade Commission um, held a consultant liable and fined the consultant because they hired a mobile marketing company uh, to call and text and et cetera, which was against some of the myriad of laws around marketing using mobile devices. And so not only was the company fined, the third party was fined, and so was the consultant who recommended that this company be hired. So the takeaway on that is for the company, you need, and this is a big need, is you need to review the contracts that you have with your vendors and be sure that your contract obligates them to follow all the privacy and data security laws that are in place that govern you. Um, and you need to do that little bit of due diligence because that goes a long way with any of the regulators. And if you think you're not under the FTC regulation, what's so interesting is that the FTC is just basically broadening um, their scope to anything that falls under deceptive or unfair business practices. And a lot of these security and, and privacy issues are getting interpreted as that. And so don't be complacent that you think that you're not under regulations because I can read you off right now about two dozen that every business has to comply with. So, so the bottom line here is be sure that your third party vendors um, are compliant with anything that you need to be compliant with and that they're held accountable for that in your contract because if something happens it can go a long way for you to mitigate your risk and your costs associated with that. So, so let's, this is a good place for a break. We will take a break from this and do a station identification. SLMA Live is an internet radio broadcasting station dedicated to broadcasting programs in the business to business arena. Have you considered hosting your own internet radio program? It's easier than a webinar, has greater reach and listenership than a webinar. Internet radio is a content generation machine to reach at work listeners. For information about hosting your own program on slmalive.com, contact our producer, Jim Obermeyer, at 360-933-1259. Or visit our website, slmalive.com. Identification. I'm Susan Finch. I'm here with Linda Zimmer. I'm for SLMA Radio. We are on every Thursday at 10 a.m. or excuse me, 10:30 a.m. Pacific. And you can find us at slmaradio.com. Our main site is the slma.com. That's T H E. SLMA.com. Find out the benefits of our free membership, our enhanced membership, and sponsorship. So many ways to spread your company's message and get your knowledge out there for people to know more about how great you are. Anyways, we are here with Linda Zimmer and we are talking about privacy myths, data hacking, and many other things and we're talking about the responsibility and Linda we were deep into myth number two which is data security is the number one job of IT and you made it quite clear that it isn't just them we all in those of us that hire third-party companies that hire consultants that hire people like me too we have to make sure that everybody's on the same page as far as compliance privacy and data security so I'm gonna get right back to you Thank you. And again, thank you for having me with you. Um, you know, one of the biggest things is social engineering. And we don't think about that. So, no, it's true that IT plays a huge role in data security. But again, going back to the fact that so much data leaks through uh, many, many holes in our organization, 
social engineering is probably the one that happens most frequently. And what, what is social what is that? Yeah. Yeah. What is social engineering? Thank you. Basically <laughs> what it is is someone using known easily available information to defeat your security systems, your security um, protocols. So let's for example, um, what what security analysts love to do is go into a company and say, I can hack into your company. Well, <laughs> um, one, one of them details a very complacent CEO. We are rock solid here. You cannot break through our systems. So the analyst said, okay. So away he goes and he gets online and searches for things like um, uh, goes to the CEO's social media presences and finds out what his favorite sports team is. Of course, you can find anybody's email address and address online. Um, he also learned that uh, through social media that he was a cancer survivor and so that he was a, a big supporter of various cancer causes. So in the social engineering vein, what he did is he gathered all this information and then he calls the CEO and acts like he is um, calling from some cancer organization and encourages the um, uh, CEO to make a donation because if he does, he will get tickets to one of his favorite sports teams games Ooh. along with, you know, a signed This is like that movie, Now You See Me. Exactly. Oh my gosh. Okay. Go ahead. So the, he says, I'd like to send you a PDF um, with the information so that you know. And the CEO says, Yeah, sure. So he says, Now, what version of, of Adobe Acrobat do you use? So he gave him the version. He said, I want to be sure that I'm sending you the right so that you can open it. So he sends it along, and uh, the CEO gets it, opens it up, and voila, the PDF installs malware on his machine. And now whatever the CEO has on his machine and et cetera, et cetera, is now available to this data analyst who is doing this to prove to the CEO that there are a lot of holes in their security systems and social engineering is one of them. So that's the example of social engineering. And we get this all the time, right? You get a, you get a call from a telemarketer. And when they start probing, what are you doing this weekend? Thinking it's a way to break the ice they could actually be gathering important information that at some point they're going to use to make you feel like you're dealing with someone who you have a relationship with in some way, shape, or form. I love that example, though, that you gave. That is so powerful because a lot of us think that it's just the obvious ones, the ones that say, you know, I'm calling from Microsoft Security. And no, you're not. Microsoft doesn't call me. Exactly. You know, those, those types of things, those are the obvious but the example you just cited is so personal and so easy to be able to infiltrate into, you know, something that might not be on their guard quite as frequently as those of us that are holed up in the dark corners of a company that are used to being paranoid and cautious. Exactly. <laughs> and and you can say, you can say, hey, IT has got rock solid security measures, but here's something very human that we all want to do is connect with each other, share what we know, especially, you know, if you've had something in your life like surviving cancer and you talk about that on social media, but just be aware that that's potentially information that you're sharing that a social engineer could be using to, you know, gain your trust. Right. And we've got to be training even CEOs <laughs> that, that these are real issues for an organization. Um, and it was a way for malware to be placed on his machine. And, of course, the CEO has access to just about everything in the company, right? So kind of, kind of scary. Um, now, do you go into companies and do this role-playing kind of thing? Because, boy, does that hammer at home. It really hammers it home. And actually what we typically, what most organizations we do is we do some tabletop exercises along those routes. Yeah. Um, there are real hacking experts that kind of do this as well, but are coming at it from the standpoint of, you know, testing all of your systems. You know, what I tend to do is focus on tabletop exercises that drive this home. Um, I'm not the one actually, you know, 
trying to hack into their systems <laughs> that we that we need hacker hacker analysts for but, um, <laughs> but you know we we really work hand in hand with IT and with these uh, security analysts um, because they're the ones who really help companies understand um, where their vulnerabilities are and of course what you have to do as a company is is prioritize right right you cannot spend all of your resources on security, right? I mean, and nothing is 100% secure. So we have to kind of be realistic about that, but you've got to set some priorities. What's interesting, and I think this was a, a study that uh, Forrester recently did, was that most CEOs put the vast majority of their resources into IT security. But what this story demonstrates is you've got to balance that with making employees at all levels of your organization aware of what some of the vulnerabilities are. Even it's right this, here. I mean, it's, it's right that, here. It's the person. It's people. It is. It's the like you said. It's that emotional, you know, playing on that. And Tom and I, my husband and I, talk about this a lot. It's difficult to think that deeply like a weasel when you aren't one. Mm -hmm. You have to be prepared for it. It's it's a very difficult thing to anticipate, but when you get into that mindset, thinking that anytime you give out personal information to somebody other than the folks you have to your house for barbecue, mm -hmm. you are setting yourself up possibly. Yeah, you are, and and you can't be complacent about about it. what I see happening is we're all complacent. We oh my computer's locked down. I've got blocking software on my browsers. I've you know I've taken all these steps, and it's actually what comes out of our mouth most of the time, <laughs> forty percent of the time. That is the thing that that's putting our data at risk. And you know the solution is really pretty simple. Things like these tabletop exercises, making employees aware, building a culture of confidentiality, um, uh, you know, within the organization, um, watching a little bit. Another example is um, one employee who was with the company a long time suddenly started bringing a briefcase to work. Never brought a briefcase before. Oh yeah, I got this briefcase for Christmas. Isn't it really cool? I'm bringing it now to work. Well, what he was carrying was an external hard drive in that computer, and basically downloading everything, everything off the network, um, which he then took and went to a competitor, which happened to be a Chinese. I mean, this was a big deal. This was an aerospace issue um, and. Uh, uh, national security kind of thing and giving it to the to the Chinese. So but that brings up another good point though because I had that happen with somebody or another company that I'm aware of at a smaller level they aren't that big they're only like 30 employees but folders they have you know physical files and boxes of them you know were misplaced nobody really thought about it she was taking them home she was copying them she was using that to build her own business and get ready to launch it. Yeah. And yeah. those are, you know, those are security breaches. Those are real life things that have nothing to do with data. No. <laughs> yeah. I, and another one is, along those lines is um, a physical therapy company needed to destroy physical records, so they dumped them in the trash bin. <laughs> oh man. Well, some fifty thousand patient records were compromised oh that God. way. And and that wasn't because anyone was being nefarious. It was because they just weren't aware of the sensitivity and the vulnerability that it put the company at risk. And being lazy. And it is being lazy. There's but, a lot of lazy that happens. And here's another one. It's we often hire these companies to come and shred our boxes you know we put them in boxes and we didn't have that employee like you did that took them home we just gave we just gave them to the the guys and off they drove with our records in the well truck has an accident records wind up all over the freeway they blow away you know now we have a situation where we've got to contact all of our dear customers and let them know that their contact information, their private information, their sensitive information. So here's a little tip. When you hire those companies, hire one that shreds on site. Simple. Yep. 
Very simple, but well, we don't. What, what did I say in that Batman movie though? Penguin <laughs> taped it all back together. <laughs> exactly. So you know, if somebody is really determined, you want it totally destroyed, incinerated. <laughs> exactly. And exactly. I want to see the ashes in an urn. <laughs> so. Yeah, but you know, it's it's simple things like that. I mean, and again, physical security as well, social engineering. Um, somebody learns the names of certain employees. And so security is not the job of IT, it's human resources, it's finance, it's your online gurus, it's your communications people, it's your information managers, it's your physical security. All of those things work together. Segment with Linda Zimmer, who, as I said, is a certified privacy manager, and she is certified by the International Association of Privacy Professionals. She is also the president of Marcom Interactive, which specializes in digital marketing. So we have been here together. I'm Susan Finch with SLMA Radio, and we look forward to having you again when we continue this conversation. 